wanted to start actually, I was driving here today and I was having a phone call with my mom. And the reason I was having a phone call with my mom is my mom is an entrepreneur and she's had a successful business for 40 years now. And so I was asking her, I'm like, you know what, I want to start with your story because the reality is the reason why I do what I do is because you did what you did and that inspired me. So this is my family photo. This was actually out of a newspaper article when my mom was getting highlighted for the work she was doing. This was pre-me, obviously, so I was, she was pregnant with me at the time and the brothers don't matter, that's why they're not giving names. Um, but, uh, so my mom, uh, she started a company in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and the reason she started this company called Better Birth Foundation is that when she was pregnant with my brother, she was a nurse, she was actually working in um, the surgery ER two days up until when she was delivering Travis, my oldest brother, brother number one. And uh, she was really disappointed in the fact that there were no opportunities um, in labor at the time. So um, this was back in the 70s, and you know Georgia was a little bit further behind than the West Coast. The West Coast might have evolved a little bit. Um, but it was at a time when um, women were still being drugged. Um, they were actually given hallucinogenics before pregnancy and um, drugs so that they wouldn't remember childbirth. And the husbands were not allowed in the birthing room. And the doctors were oftentimes having to use forceps to remove the children. And it was just, there was no dignity in labor. And so my mom as a nurse knew this was happening. And there was a whole movement around childbirth at the time and she felt like this has absolutely got to change. Um, but, you know, it was kind of this hippie movement per se, I would say. My mom were kind of hippies and my mom and dad were both sort of hippies as well. Um, but she felt like there was a business model in it. And she said, someone has got to professionalize this industry of childbirth education if any doctors are going to take this seriously. So she went to doctors and she said, I'm a nurse. I know what you're dealing with. Let me teach the patients, refer your patients. And if you have any trouble, if anything comes out, give me a call, we'll discuss. But really, the point is, these women need to be educated about what to expect. They'll ask you less questions. They'll know what their options are, you know, all of these things. And she secured a contract, one contract in Atlanta for one um, OBGYN. And then she started getting all these referrals. And so I, when I was born, this business was already growing. She franchised it out to four franchises. They had 48 locations throughout the metro um, Atlanta airport, or um, sorry, the metro Atlanta area. Um, she ended up uh, creating her own certification system that was recognized by the American Nurses Association. She certified other nurses, and she grew this business. And it paid for all of us to go to college while my dad was a stay-at-home dad and an artist. So I was, <laughs> I was raised by my dad, but got to watch my mom run this very successful business. And also went over and worked with her um, when I was in you know, high school. So I got to do all these things and watch her run her business. And I think that some of the things that I learned out of that were she felt really passionate about this. I mean, she wouldn't have done it otherwise. We struggled sometimes. I mean, we didn't take family vacations all the time. We were always barely making a profit, if at all. I mean, we had shareholders per se, but there was never any return to the shareholders. This was done out of pure passion for the fact that this had to change. And, you know, at this point in time, the movement has changed. I mean, I think that we would all say this just doesn't happen anymore in labor. I mean, it's crazy to us to even think about this at a time. Um, today, and I think my mom played a really key role in that. She's been honored as you know, one of the top four childbirth educators in America. And I think that's a testament to the fact that she had the ability to really stick with something and believe in it. <laughs> so I work with an organization called World of Good, and I think one of the um, you know, inspirations for my mom was that I, I've always been attracted to jobs where I feel like I'm doing something for the social good. And, you know, I look at normal job postings and I'm like, oh, they're exciting. But then I go on Idealist and I'm like, oh, those are so exciting. And that's where I want to be. I want to feel like I'm making a difference in the world. And so I have been working in Washington, D.C. for a while at different nonprofits, much more government related. And I felt really disconnected from the work. And I think for me it was because it was very government based. It was hard to see the immediate impacts. And I got a call from someone I was working with, I had worked with in D.C. just years later, and she said, come out to San Francisco and start this nonprofit with me. And I said, uh, I don't think so. I'm an East Coast girl. I don't know about moving to San Francisco. And she's like, explain to me that it's this hybrid business, it's a socially responsible company, and a nonprofit. The nonprofit owns equity in the company. It was started by three Haas Business School students. 
and they wrote this business model, they got venture backing, you know, there was a real for-profit, they got venture backing, the nonprofit has gotten funding from the people that started with eBay, and I thought, okay, maybe I'll consider it now. And then I came out here and I was like, wait a second, I can't believe I ever thought about not moving to San Francisco. <laughs> so I picked up, I had flipped a house, so I always, you know, even in my life, I was thinking of uh, ways to make money, but at the same time trying to do social good. And I had actually purchased a house and redid the whole thing from scratch by myself and did all the work, and then I sold it for a profit, and I moved out here, which was, thank God I did that, because it was before the housing crisis. And then I moved out here and started this organization with her. And we've been through a lot of ups and downs. Last year, we actually sold the company to eBay, and the nonprofit spun off on its own. So we were actually a social responsible importer of fair trade handmade goods from around the world. So we worked with a lot of women's cooperatives, the idea of income generation for women in other countries. And the nonprofit was very focused on improving industry standards. So we sold that company. Uh, we no longer had an equity stake in the company. So the nonprofit's business model kind of got flipped on its head. So in the last year, uh, I've been working really hard actually to redefine our business model and to look at what kind of earned income can we have as an organization? And what sort of social enterprise can we offer to companies? So we've been exploring that and looking at ways we, you know, our core competency is using technology to increase transparency and global supply chains. So we're looking at providing services to multinational companies so that they can track working conditions in their supply chains and the impact that they're having on their workers. So not only as a risk mitigation, but also to look at ways you can actually improve efficiency by investing in the workers in the bottom of your supply chain. So that's what we've been working on in the last year, but it's been hard. And I think I'm gonna flip through these real quick. So challenges, you know, I'm not the founder. Like we were saying, sometimes you have to be the person that takes it from the founder's position and moves it up the ladder. It's like you look at Super Bowl coaches and often like the person that can get someone to the Super Bowl is not the person that can win the Super Bowl, all right? You can get something somewhere. Sometimes it's time for someone else to come in and take your idea to the next level. And we've had three different executive directors. Now, I always ran the program work because I loved program work and the idea of asking for money was not exciting to me, uh, but I've had to step in um, when we lost our second ED, and the reason we lost them is there was high burnout. There's a lot of pressure on you to raise money, there's a lot of pressure on you to do these things, and you really have to believe in what you're doing or you're going to burn out. And so I've taken over at this point, um, but I think that's one of the risks and one of the challenges we face. Financially, in 2009, we actually, I went to part-time, I took myself to part-time because I was afraid we were gonna run out of money. And then that fall, uh, we won the Tech Awards, which is a big awards um, ceremony through the Tech Museum of Innovation. So we were a cash prize laureate, and we got $50,000. And we were, that just barely you know, got us through. And then another funder came in and topped it off for another 50. And so then, I want to say something yeah, sure. here, Audrey, because I think it's a really important point. It's really comfortable to do program in a nonprofit. It's education, it's teaching, it's service oriented. It's much harder to take the risk of rejection and the creativity of asking for money. But you did exactly the right thing because you're exactly the kind of person people want to give money to because you're so passionate. And if you know the program, you can articulate the vision. So um, there's no uh, category of birth of nonprofit leaders. There's only people who grow into nonprofit leaders. And I cannot stand when executive directors muck up. I would much rather bet on a program person to jump in, get that person out, and stabilize and sustain the organization. So the only thing I would say is I wish you'd done it sooner. And I, you know what, to <laughs> tell you the truth, I kind of wish I had done it sooner too. Yeah. I was given the opportunity when we hired our second ED. I had just gone through watching my best friend suffer for years trying to raise money for us. She was our ED, and I just said, there's no way I'm taking that on. That, that was exhausting. And I look back on it and I said I wish I had because now I realize it's actually not that hard. When you believe in what you're doing and you can articulate that, people will give you money. It's not as like frightening as it seems. So we had this uh, entrepreneur who came out of Wharton. She started her own business, Pet Insurance. And she said to me, the most important piece of advice you gave me is if you have to ask yourself, do you have the right person three times, you have the wrong person. <laughs> so, those of you that say, do I have the right boss, or do I have the right executive director, 
or do I have a development director? One of the biggest myths in nonprofit is that you can hire a development director that can raise money. And we spend, we'll talk about that later, but it just does not happen in, in your dreams it might happen. And so it's so much better to just hire around your strengths and realize you are the leader. And that, and we made that mistake too. We hired a development director at one point. It didn't work out. It wasn't because that person wasn't a very good worker. It was that she couldn't tell the story like you can tell the story. And I think that that was a key learning um, for us. And then programmatically, you know, what you come up with and what you do, you're not always going to be successful. Um, if you set these goals for yourself. Sometimes they're insane goals that are totally unachievable. Um, when you're doing program-related work, and so we've kind of had to, I think, work around how do, how do we measure success um, and the impacts that we're having on, on the work that we're doing on the lives of the, the workers that we really care about. And I think some of my like personal learnings from this as well is, uh, it you know, I I filtered. So when our last executive director left and I took over, I waited to hire people. So I waited to hire another staff person. We've always been really small. We've always worked contractors and I think I hesitated because I wasn't sure what I wanted them to do at that point I wasn't sure where we were going and I wish I'd hired them sooner so I brought in someone and it's just made my life about a thousand times easier but you have to have the right team so if you surround yourself with the right team you can kind of do anything and you I think understanding your own limitations what you're good at and what you're not so good at and maybe finding those people to fill in the holes of what you're not so good at and then it just make, it makes you realize how much you can accomplish when you find the right people to be on your team. Um, we are looking at a strategic alliance or a merger with another NGO. And this is something that we talked about. You know, Sometimes you've got to get over your ego and realize where the best opportunity is for the work. So I think in nonprofits, sometimes it can be hard because you're so excited about it. You're often identified with the work. And you always have to kind of bring it back and say, well, what is the best move right now? What is my chess piece? for the mission and for the work. And sometimes it's not the best chess piece for you, but that's okay because you're, the reason you love what you're doing is because you really believe in the work and the mission. So we're sort of going through these changes in organization, but I think that, um, you know, they're all growing pains and it's been an awesome opportunity and I'm just really excited to be here too. And I love Santa Clara University. We're huge fans and get lots of support from Santa Clara. So thank you all for allowing me to be here. Yeah.